the commonly encountered cells that constitutes the are the neurons. Now the function of the neuron is to carry the impulse from one part of the brain to another part of the brain or from one part of the brain to another part of the spinal cord. Now the tumors which arise from the neurons, they are known as the neuronal tumors. But far more important uh, cells are the apart from neurons are the glial cells. Now these glial cells are also known as the supporting cells. That is they help or they support the neurons in performing their primary function of conduction by either supplying the nutrients, by supplying <coughs> uh, various uh, chemicals, they supplying various hormones to the uh, neurons which are very very essential and for maintaining the micro environment of the neurons so that the in an impulse can travel through the neuron without any hitch. Now the glial cells are of various types. They can be astrocytes, they can be oligodendrocytes or they can be microglial cells. Astrocytes are one of the most important cells in the uh, among the glial cells as these cells are the ones which are in close proximity to the neurons and they are the main cells which provide support to the neurons. Oligodendroglial cells, the main function of oligodendroglial cells in the central nervous system and the Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system is the formation of myelin. This myelin is an extremely important component of nerve tra transmission as it increases the, uh, the rate or the speed of impulse transmission. The macroglial cells are usually the cells which defend the brain from any invasion, from any infection or from any inflammation that might occur in the brain. Apart from astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, macroglia, we also have another cell known as the epidermal cells and these epidermal cells are cells which line the ventricle of the tumor or sorry, ventricle of the brain. Now the tumors which arise from the glial cells are known as the gliomas. The tumors that is also we can subdivide them. The tumors which arise from the astrocytes are the astrocytomas, which arise from the oligodendrocytes are the oligodendrocytomas, which arise from the Schwann, Schwann cells are the schwannomas, which arise from the epidermal cells are the epidermomas. Apart from that, the, to protect the brain and to nurture the brain, we have uh, all of us have a covering of uh, membranes over the brain, and these are in three layers, and these are referred to as the meninges. The meninges are in three layers, the pia matter which is the closest to the brain or the spinal cord and it almost abuts the brain. Then we have the arachnoid layer and then outer la outermost layer is the dura matter and this dura matter is a thick fibrous layer covering the brain and, is a, and it is a very important structure not only <coughs> uh, it provides um, a cushion to the brain it also provides <coughs> a protection to the brain. Now, tumors which arise from the meninges are referred to as meningiomas. Apart from th these three basic structures that constitute the brain, that is the neurons, the glial cells, all the meninges, the vessels that the vessels that bring the blood or that take the blood away from the brain into the heart are are also an important component and can also lead to development of tumors. Tumors which arise from the vessels are usually referred to as the uh, endotheliomas or the, some rare tumors like sarcomatous component of certain tumors might arise from these vessels. Now tumors of the brain have been variously classified either as primate for instance the tumors of the brain have been classified as primate tumor or secondary tumor. Primate tumors are those tumors that originate in the brain that is they uh, originate either from the neurons, the glial cells, the meninges or the vessels that are, present up, that are present in the brain. Whereas there are certain tumors say for instance a patient has uh, a renal cell carcinoma or a patient has a colon carcinoma. Now when these cells they come into the blood and via the blood they reach the brain they are deposited in various parts of the brain. Uh, and when these cells which are actually coming out from outside the brain they develop into a tumor these are known as the metastases or the secondary brain tumors and these are the, one of the most common brain uh, brain tumors and i usually uh, carry a very poor prognosis these metastases can either be inside the brain parenchyma or they can be dural based that is the attached to the meninges Another way of classifying these tumors are uh, whether the tumor is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. Now benign tumor as we all know are tumors which are non-cancerous tumors and they are extremely slow growing tumors and because of the slow growing nature of the tumor they tend to push the brain parenchyma uh, away and they do not invade the brain parenchyma. Because of the slow growing nature of these tumors, these tumors are usually present with a long duration of history say for instance uh, from, uh, from uh, a large number of months to a few years. The patient might present with uh, 8 months, 10 months, 1 year, 2 year, 5, sometimes the symptoms might be as long as 5 to 6 years. Be and because they do not invade the tumor, complete excision of the tumor is usually possible in such a case because th the plane between the tumor and the brain parenchyma is very well defined. On the contrary, the tumors which are malignant tumors, these are cancerous tumors and not only are these tumors cancerous, that is they, ha they have a tendency to of growing very fast and because they grow very fast, the duration of history is very small. It's usually a matter of few months, usually 
two months, three months, at the most six months, seven months, the patient in a very short span of time will, will have dramatic symptoms. And these tumors they tend to invade into the surrounding parenchyma. Because it invades into the surrounding parenchyma, complete excision of these tumors is usually not possible. And some amount of micro residual of these tumors might remain inside the uh, operative cavity, and this leads to re recurrence of the tumor. Brain, pan, brain uh, tumors can also be classified depending upon the location of these tumors, whether these tumors are present inside the parenchyma or outside the parenchyma. If it is present outside the parenchyma, they are referred to as the extramedullary tumors. For instance, these tumors arise either from the meningiomas or they might arise from the bones, for instance, or from tum uh, normal brain parenchymal tissues which are outside the normal brain parenchyma. For instance, pituitary adenomas. And these pituitary adenomas, all the pituitary is a part of the brain parenchyma, but it is slightly, it lies slightly away from the proper brain parenchyma, and hence it, the pituitary adenomas are extra axial tumors or extra medullary tumors. Similarly, as I had discussed earlier, Meningiomas are tumors which arise from the meninges, and these meninges are covering of the brain parenchyma. That is, they are outside the brain parenchyma, and so meningiomas are classically extra axial tumors. However, far more important tumors, or, or the far rather far more common tumors, are tumors which lie inside the brain parenchyma, and these are the gliomas or the metastases, and the, usually the tumors are intraparenchymal tumors. Another location of the tumor is the intraventricular tumor. A normal brain parenchyma at the center of it. Has a, has a thin, epidermal layered pouch of uh, a CSF. This is a normal, normal, normally present in all individuals. However, sometimes the tumors are developed inside the ventricle, and these are referred to as intraventricular tumor. Intraventricular tumors are difficult to operate tumors because they are present in the dead center of the brain, and some amount of cortical breach of, uh, or one has to go through the brain parenchyma to reach the ventricle and this can lead to uh, deficits in the postoperative period. The World Health Organization has graded these tumors, the brain tumors from grade 1 to grade 4, grade 1 being the, the least the cancers or the most benign tumor and the grade 4 being the most malignant tumor. Now based on the histopathological features, the grade 1 tumor has classically has a benign cytological features and the classic example of this is pellucidic astrocytoma. Uh, the grade 2 tumors, they apart, th these tumors have a, have a moderate cellularity, but they do not, but the cells or the nucleus do not show any anaplasia or any mitotic figure, m mit significant mitosis. And the classical example of this is uh, local glamas or the fibrillary astrocytomas. Grade 3 tumors are, they not, not only do they have increased cellularity, they have anaplasia and mitosis, and they are referred to an example of this is anaplastic astrocytoma. However, the most malignant tumor of the brain parenchyma are the grade 4 tumors that not only have increased cellularity, mitosis, and aplasia, but they also have microvascular uh, proliferation and necrosis. And classical example of this is a glioblastoma and platinum neonectomal tumors. Now, as far as glamas are concerned, grade 3 and grade 4 tumors are referred to as high grade tumors, grade 2 tumors are referred to as grade low grade glamas, and grade 1 tumors are usually parasitic astrocytomas. Now, why does an individual go on to develop brain tumors? Now, this is actually n not yet known and is a, s and, uh, is a topic of serious uh, research activity going on around the world. However, certain factors uh, have been pointed out as they might, might be associated with a particular set of tumors. For instance, it has been seen that in patients of meningiomas, they, these meningiomas they classically have uh, estrogen, some meningiomas have classically have estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, and these tumors might actually tend to increase during pregnancy, indicating that, uh, and are slightly more common in females, indicating that sex might play a s some role in the development of these meningiomas. Similarly, there are certain tumors which are more common in a particular race as compared to the uh, other race. There are tumors which are quite age-specific. Uh, For instance, the tumor like primitive neuroactive development tumors of the brain parenchyma, tumors like medulloblastomas, these are classically present in younger age group, in children or in young adults, whereas tumors like metastasis, these are classically present in adult uh, population. Genetics is one of the most importantly uh, research topic nowadays as far as brain tumors are concerned. In, at some ex to some extent, we have been successful in finding out the, the genetics behind the development of glamas, which is one of the most common primary brain tumors. But even that is under uh, under thorough investigation. But for other tumors, genetics has not be, the genes in, involved or the proteins involved behind the occurrence or the causation of these tumors is yet to be discovered. Occupation exposures 
occupation exposure and certain viruses have also been labeled or have been associated with certain tumors but these are all um, inconclusively proven coming to the signs and symptoms of these patients how does a patient of brain tumor presents to you the most important and the most credited symptom of patients of, of brain tumors are that of increased intracranial pressure as we can uh, understand that brain is held inside a bony cavity or, or, or a bony structure known as the skull now because the skull is literally covered from all sides any tumor which is or any space occupying region inside the brain parenchyma when it expands it pushes the brain parenchyma against the skull and thus leads to increased intracranial pressure Intra in increased intracranial pressure typically manifests as, as common symptoms like headache and vomiting and this is one of the reasons why symptoms of headache and vomiting are missed by patients and the patients present quite late and the headache how do you differentiate a headache of a raised intracranial pressure from a from a relatively benign, benign or an innocuous headache headache of intracranial pressure raised intracranial pressure would be progressively increasing that is patient will say that for, for the past 6 months or 8 months or a year his intensity or the frequency or the duration of his headache has been increasing since a particular period of time not only that the headache would be worse in morning and it might be relieved by vomiting the vomiting classically in patients of raised intracranial pressure is a projectile is a projectile vomiting apart from headache and vomiting certain symptoms like blurring of vision <coughs> is is classically complained of uh, by patient with increased intracranial pressure and this blurring might actually occur at the peak of headache an important sign vis-a-vis -vis blurring of vision is papillary edema whenever a patient has raised intracranial pressure and we do a fundus examination we see that they, there is papillary edema or disc edema usual disc edema is usually not associated with any vision loss however if the symptoms have been persisting for a, for, for a significant period of time and the patient has not given heed to those symptoms then because of marked rise in the intracranial pressure the optic atrophy occurs and then patient can have diminution of vision patient can also complain of double vision that is especially uh, Uh, difficulty in seeing sideways say for instance a patient has a right side tumor which is which which, which is leading to to raise intracranial pressure that leads to this uh, um, transit weakness of the sixth cranial nerve and this leads to and so what will happen is when whenever the patient of sixth cranial palsy wants to see on the right side wants to see towards the right side he will not be able to move his right eye towards the object and thus he will able to, and thus he will be seeing two objects instead of one and this is a very classical symptom that is associated with increased intracranial pressure and is a very very some symptom but the most dangerous symptom in patients of raised intracranial pressure is altered sensorium if a patient has altered sensorium along with pupillary asymmetry that is dilatation of the side of one side of pupil it is an ominous sign and such patients will require immediate uh, might require immediate surgical intervention Apart from that, there are many tumors which might actually present only with seizures and might not present with raised intracranial pressure. Seizures may be generalized tonic tonic seizures, might be complex partial seizures, might be simple partial seizures, and there are certain brain tumors, for instance, ganglion gliomas, for instance, DNETs. Now, these are tumors which are classically seen in children, and they and they, their only manifestation is usually refractory seizures. That is, the patient might be on one drug, two drugs, three drugs, sometimes four and five drugs, and still the patients will have recurrent seizures, and seizures won't be controlled. and dramatically after you remove the tumor the seizure control will occur this seizure if properly evaluated will have a localizing value and one can find out based on only on the basis of history of seizure that with whether the tumor is on the right side or on the left side whether the tumor is on the frontal lobe parietal lobe temporal lobe or the occipital lobe <coughs> if the tumor is present in the, uh, in an eloquent area of the brain then patient might present with focal neurological deficits and this might present earlier as compared to the patients who have raised intracranial pressure because the patient say for instance a patient has a tumor in the uh, motor cortex a tumor which is present in the motor cortex will present with weakness of the contralateral upper limb and the lower limb and this leads to hemiparesis on the contrary if the tumor is present in the intermesary fissure that is between the two lobes of the brain and the patient can present with paraparesis that is weakness of both the lower limbs because of the distribution of the motor homunculus on the contrary if the patient has a uh, brain tumor in the brain stem then because all the cortical spinal tracts or the pyramidal tracts that traverse through the brain stem patient might actually have quadriparesis that is weakness of all the four limbs both the upper limbs and both the lower limbs similarly if the patient has symptoms uh, sorry tumor in the speech area he or she will have difficulty in speech 
refer to as the aphasia. If the patient has symptoms, uh, tumor in the thalamus or the tumor in the parietal lobe, patient may go on to develop sensory symptoms. If the patient has tumor close to the optic apparatus or to the near the occipital lobe or sometimes in the temporal lobe or the parietal lobe, patient might have classical visual field effects. Apart from that, depending upon the lobe that is being involved, the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe or the occipital lobe, patient might actually have lobar symptoms. If the tumor is present in the posterior fossa, then the posterior fossa houses two very very important structures that is the cerebellum and the brain stem. Now cerebellar symptoms classically patient will say that while he walks he has tendency to fall towards one side referred to as the limpataxia or sometimes even when he stands up on standing also patient will have ataxia that is referred to as the truncal ataxia. Patient might have tremors. Tremor in cerebellar, in cerebellar uh, cases is classically an intention tremor. That is, when the patient tries to reach out for an object, as soon as he goes closer and closer to the object, the tremors will keep on increasing and the maximum tremor will occur when he's just about to pick that object. This is referred to as the intention tremor. Patient can also have dysmetry, that is, his, he will, will not be able to accurately calculate the distance between him and the object that he intends to pick up. He can have dysartokinesia, he can have nystagmus, he can have pendular jerks and even slurred speech. Pendular jerk is classically checked uh, on the knee and, and normally uh, uh, when you check on the knee jerk, two and a half to three oscillations of the, of the limb will occur. However, if there is more than that, then that is referred to as the pendular jerks and is a marker for cerebellar symptoms, uh, sorry, cerebellar signs. Similarly, in, if the tumor is present in the brain stem, as I had mentioned earlier, patient might go on to develop weakness of all the four limbs, patient can develop sensory symptoms, patient can have, left, uh, can have multiple cranial involvement depending upon the brain part of the brain stem involved. For instance, if a patient has a tumor in the brain, uh, mm. uh, sorry, uh, in the midbrain, patient might have third and fourth cranial palsy. If the patient has uh, uh, tumor in the pons, patient might have fifth and fifth, sixth, seventh cranial palsy. If the patient has tumor in the medulla oblongata, patient might have lower cranial palsies. But the classical thing is that patient will have multiple cranial involvement and not only multiple cranial involvement, patient might have, will have bilaterality of symptoms in these cases if the patient has brain stem symptom. Another very important symptom that might represent or sign that might represent in patients of midbrain, uh, sorry, of patients of brain stem involvement, especially the midbrain are the eye signs. The gaze movement of the eyes are controlled primarily by the midbrain and patient might have gaze palsies. Coming to the investigation, now although x-ray has been used traditionally for uh, diagnosis of brain tumors but as of now it is uh, hardly of any significant use. Perhaps its use might be to some extent in cases of pituitary adenomas where we one wants to look at the cella, the cellar anatomy and to find out what is the anatomy of the cella, the spinoid sinuses. Uh, so that uh, an approach for that can be planned, but these are now being done primarily by the CT scans or the MRIs, and it is usually not much used nowadays as far as X-ray is concerned. So the initial investigation of, uh, that is done for a patient of brain tumor is usually a computerized tomography or the CT scan. The another advantage of CT scan is it is relatively easily available at periphery as compared to MRI. MRI is a much more sophisticated investigation and is usually present in the larger cities or in certain certain institutional uh, hospitals or some larger hospitals where they can afford MRI. But in many of the cases you can see that the CT scan is usually more than sufficient to take up the patient for surgery, to plan surgery in these cases and to operate upon these patients. And it's a very very important thing that helps, that is present, that provides the CT scan is the post-operative period. In post-operative period, CT scan is an extremely, extremely handy investigation. For instance, the most important complication that might develop in the post-operatively in patients who are operated for brain tumor is hematoma. So if a hematoma develops, CT scan is the investigation of choice. Another advantage of CT scan over an MRI is its ability to delineate the bony anatomy. See, many times the tumor are in location to a particular part of the skull. For that, one might need the bony anatomy of the skull and for that CT scan is far better. A contrast CT scan is far superior than a non-contrast CT scan if diagnosis of tumor has to be established. But, but investigation of choice is definitely MRI and because the soft tissue anatomy of the tumor, soft tissue anatomy of the brain parenchyma is very well defined in MRI. And with MRI of high Tesla, like three Tesla machines available for clinical application, a beautiful MRI uh, delineation of the, the tumor can be seen. Apart from that, various other adjuncts of <coughs> MRI like MR angiography, MR venography, 
uh, they add to the uh, surgical planning of these tumors. For, um, later sequences, uh, addition of later sequences like MR spectroscopy, uh, which helps us in finding out the particular component of the tumor and helps us predicting the the nature of the tumor, the pathology of the tumor, and also helps us in prognosticating tumors uh, is possible. Patients who have diffusion vetted, uh, they are diffusion vetted images that are being developed, and these helps us in diagnosis of, say, for instance, epidermoids. Epidermoids in the brain, they classically show restriction of the diffusion. So, by various permutation of combinations of MRI sequences, one can, in majority of the time, one can be able to establish the pathological diagnosis of the tumor. However, the final say would be that of the pathologist after the biopsy has been done. Another very important component of MRI is referred to as the functional MRI. Now, this functional MRI is one has to understand that, say, for instance, the patient has a tumor which is close to the motor cortex or which is close to the language, that is the speech area, or other eloquent areas of the brain. Now, if you operate upon those patients, then the chances are that, that the, those patients might go on to develop a particular deficit. Say, for instance, a tumor in the motor cortex, patient might go on to develop hemiplegia. Patient in the speech area, if you op tumor, operate upon tumor in the speech area, patient might go on to develop uh, aphasias. Now, with the help of functional MRI, we in the preoperative period we are able to find out where exactly is the motor cortex in relationship to the in relation to the tumor, where exactly is the speech cortex in relationship to the tumor. So that part of the tumor might not be touched, or there are other ways of identifying the tumor or resulting the tumors with minimal or postoperative deficit. An adjunct to the functional MRI is a diffuser tensor imaging, which helps us in tracking the entire corticospinal tract right from the brain, uh, sorry, from the uh, point of origin to the brainstem and down, so that we know in relationship to the tumor where are the corticospinal tracts displaced, and so a better uh, treatment planning can be done, and which leads to usually leads to uh, literally no deficit in the postoperative period, despite tumor being exactly near the motor cortex. Other adjunctive investigation that we normally do is like CSF analysis, which is commonly done for patients who have uh, drop metastasis, uh, for instance, tumors in the posterior fossa like um, epidermomas or medulloblastomas or certain aggressive tumors like glioblastomas. Now, these tumors are known to have spread by CSF, and on CSF uh, analysis, if you find that there are tumors in the CSF, that usually portends a poorer prognosis. And other condition, then other investigation like electroencephalography are usually done for patients who have seizure, the presence of seizure. Perimetry can be done for patients who have involvement of the optic apparatus to see whether any visual field effects are present or not. Audiometry is usually done for those patients who present with uh, acoustic schwannomas, that is tumor of the eighth cranial nerve. In this patient, they classically present with hearing loss. Significant or profound hearing loss would be present in these patients. Patients who have tumors of the pituitary adenoma or patients who have tumor near the uh, cella which houses the pituitary and endocrine profile is extremely important. It not only establishes the diagnosis, but also it is very important for operative, perioperative management of these patients. Now, <clears throat> another adjunct which is often used in neurosurgical practices is biopsy of the tumor. Sometimes the tumor is in deep location and operating upon that patient might actually be extremely detrimental for that patient. So in those cases, we tend to take biopsies. Now, biopsies can either be done by open methods, that is, entire chronotomy is done and a biopsy is taken, or um, in the recent past, uh, conditions uh, by methods like seotactic, uh, method we can um, by only making a simple hole we can take the biopsy deep down the brain and then find out wh whether the, the tumor that has been found out is chemosensitive or not or is radio sensitive or not and direct radiotherapy or uh, and or chemotherapy can be given to this patient and the patient can be spared of the uh, stress of the uh, associated with uh, surgery now stereotactic uh, biopsy can either be frame based methods or by neuro navigation methods which are referred to as the frame based stereotactic biopsies now, what are the treatment options that we have? The mainstay of the treatment of brain tumors because of the mass effect that these tumors carry is the surgery. And majority of the tumors, they, oper are, the, they are operated upon and, and majority of the tumors are taken care of by surgery. Surgery might have to, uh, might have to be done in almost all the tumors in one form of the, or the other. That might extend from total excision of the tumor, especially in benign tumors like meningiomas to biopsy like brainstem gliomas or of tumors like thalamic tumors where only a biopsy might be sufficient for further management of these tumors. 
as I just said, surgery is helpful for both low-grade gliomas as well as high-grade gliomas. And after the surgery has been done, depending upon the radiotherapy, depending upon the biopsy of the patient, radiotherapy or chemotherapy can be given to the patient. A combination of them or either of them can be given to the patient. And, a dis and a, in the recent past, addition of gum, uh, stereotactic radio surgery has also improved the outcome of these patients. Now coming to certain common tumors that we encounter in the in the brain, the most important primary brain tumor that we encounter is the gliomas. And as I had earlier mentioned, gliomas are tumors which arises from the glial cells. It has been co commonly seen that these tumors are they manifest between uh, either in the middle age or in the uh, the older age group and the incidence of these tumors it tends to increase with age. It has been seen that radiation is a definite risk factor for development of, uh, of these gliomas. Gliomas that we had discussed earlier are of various subtypes depending upon the cell of origin. It could be astrocytomas, it could be oligodendrogliomas or it could be a mixture of oligodendrogliomas and astrocytomas referred to as oligoastrocytomas. That is, these are those tumors which have both oligo component as well as astro components and these are referred to as oligoastrocytomas or we can have epilnymomas. WHO classification is based primarily on the that is grade 1 to grade 4 tumors are based primarily on whether cellularity, ATP is present or not and the telia proliferation and necrosis is there or not. Depending upon the presence or absence of these 4-5 criteria, WHO has classified these tumors from grade 1 to grade 5 or 4. Coming to individual tumors like pilocytic astrocytoma. Now, pilocytic astrocytoma are classically seen in children or in young adults and are classically seen in posterior fossa tumors. However, they can be seen as a potential, but they are far more common in posterior fossa. As I had earlier told you that these are gram, sorry, these are grade 1 tumors and so they have excellent prognosis that completely excised and they may or may not be associated with neurofibrotosis type 1 which is a neurocotonia syndrome. The grade 2 tumor is a diffuse fibrillary astrocytoma and it is also commonly encountered in young adults but it is encountered in the supernatural compartment in the cerebral hemisphere and as I had earlier mentioned these are grade 2 tumors in these cases complete oxygen may be a problem because this tumor have a tendency to infiltrate and thus complete oxygen of this tumor may be an issue especially if they are located near the eloquent cortex where complete oxygen might not be possible and these tumors because they create two tumors they have a tendency of malignant transformation and it is said that after about 8 to 10 years they may transform into a higher grade grade 3 or a grade 4 tumor. Now, anaplastic astrocytomas and glioblastoma multiformis, these are grade 3 and grade 4 tumors and they have been cleft together in one consortium that is known as the high grade lesion. And usually because their tumors they grow rapidly, they usually present with raised intracranial pressure and they are classically supertentorial. However, infratentorial that is in the cerebellum, they can occur but they are far more common in the supertentorial compartment. Now, glioblastoma multiformi can be primary glioblastoma multiformi or secondary glioblastoma multiformi. Primary glioblastoma multiformi means that without any precedent history or without any precedent preceding history or radiological evidence of uh, a local glioma, the glioblastoma multiformi has developed on its own. Whereas a secondary glioblastoma multiformi are those tumors in which patient earlier had local gliomas, like they create two gliomas, uh, and then they develop into grade three, and now they have developed into grade four um, glioblastoma multiformi. So these are referred to as secondary glioblastoma multiformi. As I had earlier mentioned, there are certain genetic mutations that have been identified with primary, primary glioblastoma multiformi and certain genetic mutations which have been found out with secondary glioblastoma multiformi. These, they classically uh, on radiology, uh, either a CT scan or an MRI, contrast enhanced MRI, they appear as ring enhancing lesions, but various enhancing patterns can be seen, but they are classically uh, enhancing lesions. <coughs> However, local glioblastoma, on the other hand, are usually non enhancing, and I said that. If enhancement is present in a local glioma, that usually indicates that it might actually be of a slightly higher grade than what it is uh, intending to be. And in these cases, they might actually have a slightly poorer prognosis as compared to a non-enhancing local glioma. For local gliomas, T2-weighted images are more important as compared to the contrast imaging because contrast patients, these this, this tumors will not take up any contrast. The median survival for glioblastoma is approximately a year. If the patient has complete oxygen along with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, then his survival is approximately 14 months. But in absence of any of these, then his survival is nearly a year or even less than that. Anaplastic astrocytoma will last for about 2 to 3 years. Local gliomas will have an average lifespan of 5 to 6 years. Grade 1 astrocytoma, they have a uh, median survival of 8 to 10 years. However, from grade 2, the transformation to a higher grade has often been seen. 
Coming to oligodendroglymas, I discussed earlier, oligodendroglymas are tumors which arise from oligodendrocytes and they, are, they account for less than 10% of, of all the glymas and they are primarily in the supertentorial region and rarely found in the infratentorial region, classically affecting the maze and histologically the classic, ex <coughs> the classic finding is that of a fried egg appearance. Now these oligodendroglymas are said to have better prognosis as compared to the astrocyte Toma counterparts, and not only that, in a patient uh, in a patient with astrocytes as cytoma, if an oligodendroglial component is present, that is, an, if a patient has an uh, uh, oligodendrocytoma, his prognosis is better than those tumors uh, who have only astrocytoma. That is, astrocytomas have the worst prognosis, oligodendrocytoma have better prognosis, and oligodendroglymas have the best prognosis if these three categories of tumors are concerned. Another thing is that uh, oligodendroglymas have been associated with 1p19q loss of heterozygosity, and if this mutation is present, that usually indicates a better response to chemotherapy and hence a better prognosis. If it is a low grade oligodendroglyma, they have a median survival of 8 to 12 years. If it is an anaplastic oligodendroglyma, then they have an average survival of about 5 years. Epidermomas, as I had earlier told you, they are uh, arise from epidermoma, which is a uh, ventricular lining, and these tumors are usually intraventricular, but they can be extraventricular. In children, they are classically seen in the infratentorial compartment, but on the contrary, in adults, they are commonly seen in the supertentorial compartment. Classically, they are low-grade histology, that is grade 2 histology, and so complex screen is possible. However, higher relation like anaplastic epidermomas can be encountered, and usually those have poorer prognosis as compared to the low good counterparts. Meningiomas are the second most common primary brain tumors and they commonly occur in middle aged individuals and are rare in children. However, in when these meningiomas are present in children, they usually present in at unusual locations like skull based meningiomas or intraventricular meningiomas, but they can be seen in periodic age group. If meningioma is present in patients who have neurofibromatosis type 2, they are more likely to be multiple meningiomas. Meningiomas, as discussed earlier, the, as it arises from the meninges, they are classically dural based uh, structures and they derive their blood supply from the dura matter uh, through the menin meningeal artery, of th which is the branch of the external nucleotide artery. Although uh, majority of the two meningiomas are dural based, but they can be present inside the ventricle and they are referred to as the intraventricular meningiomas. Why does a meningioma develop is not known. However, various uh, pathology, sorry, various etogenesis have been postulated like development like uh, a prior history of therapy or a prior history of uh, viral infection even trauma has been said to be associated with meningioma but these are all um, um, anecdotal case reports or uh, they are thought to be associated with meningioma but, but clinching evidences of these associating with meningioma is, is not yet found. Certain meningiomas but also have estrogen and progesterone receptors and this is one reason why during pregnancy the meningiomas might actually enlarge and after the mother had delivered the child the tumors might actually shrink, indicating that estrogen and progesterone hormones might have some role to play in the development of a meningioma. Meningiomas are classically lower tumors, they are grade 1 tumors, however certain vari variants of meningiomas like uh, clear cell meningiomas or cordoid meningiomas or uh, 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 atypical meningiomas or papillary meningiomas, rhabdoid meningiomas or anaplastic meningiomas, these are grade 2 and grade 3 meningiomas but they are usually less in numbers. Majority of the meningiomas for all practical purposes are grade 1 meningiomas but they are high vascular tumors and they bleed uh, uh, because uh, they, they are they extremely, extremely vascular tumors and patient might have significant blood loss during the surgery of a meningioma. These tumors are dural based tumors and not only are they dural based tumors, sometimes they breach the dura and they start invading the overlying bone also and even if they don't invade the overlying bone, this, the bone associated which is in close proximity to the uh, underlying meningioma might actually go thick, thickened, might actually become hyperostotic and as I had mentioned earlier through the middle meningeal artery uh, which is a branch of the external carotid artery, the majority of the meningiomas they get their blood supply. The meningiomas may be uh, located at various places, commonly it is in the cerebral convexity meningiomas, might be associated, might be present in along the fox, might be present along the sinus, might be interventricular or might be present in the skull base that like the olfactory group meningioma, the spinoidic meningioma or the cerebral pontine angle meningiomas. The investigation of choice is like for any brain tumor is a CT scan or an MRI. In CT scan, these tumors are classically iso-intense to slightly hyper-intense. 
On MRI, T1 metal images, these tumors are usually I7 intense, so slightly hyper intense. On T2 metal MRI, these are uh, hyper intense, and on contrast, they are intense contrast enhancement. And depending upon the location of the tumor, say for instance, the meningioma is close to the sinus, in which case uh, uh, a, a magnetic uh, MR venographic field would be required to find out the status of the venous sinuses. On the contrary, if the tumor is uh, near the cerebral fissure, we need to find out the location, the location and the relationship of the tumor with the internal carotid artery or the anterior cerebral artery and the middle meningeal artery. And hence, it is very important for us to find out on the relationship of the tumor with these vessels for that MR angiography might become an important role. Complete excision of the tumor is usually the treatment of choice and if possible that is the best treatment uh, of meningioma as no further the modality of treatment is usually required in these cases. However, sometimes uh, because of various reasons, for instance involvement of the um, uh, sinuses, sometimes complete excision of the tumor might not be possible. In those cases, the extent of excision it determines the recurrence rate and if the tumor residual is there, then the chances of this tumor be, uh, these tumors recurring would be high in these cases. <coughs> Radiotherapy in the postoperative period would be required in those patients who have residual tumors or those tumors who have higher grade tumors like grade 2 or grade 3 tumors where postoperative radiotherapy might be indicated. The third most common tumors that we encounter in a, uh, in a uh, brain tumor are the pituitary adenomas. These pituitary adenomas can be microadenomas that is by definition they are less than 1 cm or could be macroadenoma that is more than 1 cm. Microadenomas they are because they are also they are highly they are very small tumors less than 1 cm tumors but they are endocrinologically active tumors that is they are secreted tumors they secrete certain hormones they might secrete thyroid hormone they might secrete growth hormone they might secrete steroids cortisol they might secrete prolactin and depending upon what hormone has been secreted the patient will go on to tell you the symptoms of those diseases. Uh, to those diseases and not only those diseases, the symptoms of those diseases, they will also go on to develop multiple comorbidities. For instance, a patient who has growth hormone secretion tumor, that is, the patient might go on to develop acromegaly. In these patients, they will go on to develop hypertension, diabetes, and these are the conditions which are very, very detrimental for the patient's uh, life. Uh, as that among the uh, uh, secreted tumors, prolactin secreting tumor, that is, the prolactinomas are the most common secreting tumors. If the growth hormone uh, secreting tumors is present before uh, epiphyseal closure, then the patient might go on to develop gigantism. However, if uh, it occurs after epiphyseal closure, which is the more common thing to occur, patient might go on to develop acromegaly. Patient might actually develop uh, have ACG secreting tumor, that is the Cushing syndrome, and rarely patient might have uh, follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone or thyroid stimulating hormone secreting tumors. But these are extremely rare tumors. The common tumors that we encounter are the prolactinomas, the growth hormone secreting tumors, or the uh, ACTS ACT secreting tumors. On the contrary, a macroadenomas are tumors which are more than 1 cm in size, and these tumors they are usually endocrinologically silent tumors and they usually present with mass effect because of compression of the surrounding structures. For instance, they might compress the optic apertures, patient might present with, with various field cuts like bitemporal hemianopia, binasal hemianopia, or homonymous hemianopia, depending upon the uh, the the point at which the optic apparatus is involved. They might actually compress the normal pituitary leading to hyperpituitarism. They might cause compression over the st uh, stalk leading to prolactin access. Another interesting uh, presentation met um, uh, method by which the pituitary adenomas they present is referred to as a bleeding in the tumor which is referred to as medical terminology as pituitary apoplexy. Pituitary apoplexy might sometimes be a dramatic presentation in an otherwise um, in an otherwise normal patient. Patient might have sudden onset severe holoclinal headache with repeated heads with uh, repeated episodes of vomiting. Third, fourth, sixth skin nerve might be involved simultaneously. Patient might have sudden onset vision loss, and patient might actually have ultrasensorium in a very short span of time. And apoplexy, when present, might actually warrant an emergent surgery in certain cases after uh, uh, after endocrinological. Uh, um, uh, maintenance has been done, we might have to need to take up this patient for emergency surgery. Majority, the good thing about pituitary adenomas are that majority of these tumors are benign and pituitary carcinoma are an extremely rare tumors but whenever carcinomas of the of pituitary tumors are present, they usually have tendency to invade into the surrounding structures like they invade the uh, you know, uh, sinuses, they invade into the cavernous sinuses which lie, lie side by side with the pituitary, uh, to the cella, they can invade the sphenoid sinuses, they can inv invade uh, the, th the pro the third ventricle and then they usually have a very poor prognosis. Then they usually have a very very poor prognosis.
The treatment modality that is available for pituitary tumors is ranges from chemotherapy in form of hormonal therapy to surgery to radiation therapy. Hormonal therapy might be the investigation, uh, sorry, treatment of choice for certain tumors uh, like uh, prolactinomas, drugs like bromocryptine, cavergolin. They have been now frequently used for, for treatment of prolactinomas and the tumors will actually shrink to a very significant uh, 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 would significantly decrease in the size after chemotherapy and surgery might not actually be needed in these cases. However, for certain tumors, chemotherapy uh, in form of hormone therapy might only be used to buy time so that surgery can be done in these cases or surgery is the mainstay of treatment for other type of pituitary adenomas. Not only that, hormone replacement also plays a very, very important role as far as replacement is concerned because when you remove the pituitary tumor, these patients either because of the size of the tumor, they have destroyed the normal pituitary or intraoperatively, sorry, or postoperatively, patient might require permanent or temporary uh, hormone replacement for a certain period of time. Surgery for pituitary adenomas or for uh, other cellular tumors like craniopharyngiomas is either done by open transcranial method or it can be done by transnasal method. Now transnasal methods are of two methods, either one can have a microscopic method or an endoscopic method. Nowadays, more and more surgeries are being done by endoscopic transnasal methods. However, still microscopic transnasal methods and open methods are still prevalent. If a tumor is just remnant after uh, uh, the surgery has been done, especially in cases of uh, functional tumors, then radiotherapy has a, has a definitive role to play and sorry, radiotherapy uh, uh, has a definitive role to play and these patients uh, when they undergo radiation therapy this might not only control their hormonal uh, imbalances but might also control their tumor growth and also prevent their uh, diminution of vision uh, which might occur in the later stage of uh, later stage when the tumor actually tends to regrow radio surgery in form of uh, either gamma knife or linear accelerators are also available and if a small part of tumor is left then a focused beam one sitting radio surgery can be done for these patients and these patients usually will have a long time to survive. Now pituitary adenomas although their pituitary adenomas are the most common cellular tumors other tumors as I had mentioned was like craniopharyngiomas, germinomas, Rathkes clusters are present in, in the cellular region in the same locality that, uh, or certain even meningiomas like diaphragm cellular meningiomas, uh, tuberculum cellular meningiomas, meters phenotic meningiomas. Now, th all these are tumors which are present near the cellar, near the pituitary, and their presentation might almost mimic that of a pituitary adenoma. And the surgical cons consideration is also similar to that of a meningioma, also that of a pituitary adenoma, and they can be either managed through uh, open methods or by transnasal endoscopy.